Today on Brief History, we take a brief look at a king who would find his way to the British throne from a foreign land. His rise to prominence was for some time considered unlikely, but he and his family would work tirelessly to elevate their claims to authority. His life and time as king would see international war, intense family struggles, a murderous marriage affair, and a dynastic transition on a world stage. Join me as I take a brief look at the first Hanoverian King of Britain, remembered today as King George I. George was born on May 28, 1660, in the city of Hanover, part of the Duchy of brunswick luneburg in the Holy Roman Empire in modern-day Germany. He was the son of Ernest Augustus, Duke of brunswick luneburg eventual Prince of Kallenberg, which was a junior or cadet branch of the Brunswick Dukes. George's mother was Sophia of the Palatinate, a granddaughter of the first Stuart King of England, James I, who will be discussed later in George's story. George would end up having six legitimate siblings that survived to adulthood, five of these siblings being younger brothers. The history of the Dukes of brunswick luneburg is complex and will not be discussed in detail here, but it is important to note a couple things before discussing George's early life. First, although we will refer to George's house throughout this discussion as the House of Hanover or Hanoverian, this in reality was not something that George or his family would have necessarily referred to themselves as. In fact, the Hanover name being attributed to George's house was an English invention for simplicity purposes, as George's family's house would have been known as the House of Welf or Gelf, an ancient German house, and they themselves would have been styled as the Dukes of brunswick luneburg which could further be distinguished from each other by their specific branches. That is not to say that the Hanover name was not eventually officially acknowledged and accepted within brunswick luneburg and used. It was, but not until a later date, nor is that to say that Hanover was not used colloquially in other regards. It also was, especially after the cadet branch of Kallenberg's capital was moved to Hanover in 1636. The point here is to notate that Hanover can certainly be argued to be inaccurate by those who care specifically about titles and who are keen to point these issues out. Nevertheless, for simplicity purposes, and due to the fact that the perspective of this discussion is intended to be from that of George as King of Britain, Hanover will be the term used when referring to George's family house and homeland. With that being said, it is also prudent to give a quick synopsis of George's family background, specifically related to his father Ernest Augustus, due to the fact that his father's experiences would have a large impact on George's life. George's father Ernest Augustus was the youngest child of five children, having three older brothers. Through the deaths of some of these brothers, George's father was able to piece by piece gather titles, territory, and prestige to the point that by 1679, he had become the prince of the junior Kallenberg line of brunswick luneburg This came about due to two of George's father's elder brothers dying, while the remaining elder brother, George's uncle, named George William, relinquished some of his claims to George's father. This paternal uncle, George William, will come up again shortly. George was born a large and healthy child, and his six siblings were all born relatively soon after he was. His birth in 1660 was followed by his younger brother, Frederick Augustus, in 1661, another younger brother, Maximilian William, in 1666, a younger sister, Sophia Charlotte, in 1668, a younger brother, Charles Philip, in 1669, another younger brother named Christian Henry in 1671, and the last youngest brother, Ernest Augustus, in 1674. In addition to these siblings, George also had two illegitimate half-siblings through his father's mistress. George's mother was said to have been a devoted and loving mother, and often personally interacted and cared for her children. George and his eldest, younger brother Frederick Augustus were often grouped together and learned much from their father as they grew. They would ride and hunt with him, and George was said to have been particularly interested in military matters. George was said to have taken his lessons seriously and was keen to please his mother. However, he was said to have gone through a period of reservation in his adolescence, which was eventually corrected. George, having taken an interest in warfare, 
accompanied his father on campaign at the young age of 15 to begin his lessons on this topic. At this point, we must go back to George's paternal uncle, George William, who we touched on briefly previously. Interestingly, George's mother, Sophia, had originally been engaged to George's uncle, George William, but after George William got cold feet, he had promised not to marry in order to make George's father, Ernest Augustus, more appealing, as it gave him a higher chance of inheriting a princely title at that time. No one knew how their inheritance would eventually shake out as all the brothers were still alive. However, by the time that George's other uncles had died, passing on titles and possessions as we touched on previously, George's uncle, George William, had fathered a daughter with the woman he had fully committed to. Thus, George William not only went back on his word and eventually married this woman, but also legitimized the daughter that had been born to the Union. Worse yet, because this girl was the daughter of George's father's elder brother, her marriage would have large dynastic implications, as any potential husband could insert himself into the inheritance picture. George's father had intended that upon George's uncle, George William's death, he, or his family, would inherit George William's titles and positions, as he, Ernest Augustus, would be the only remaining brother left. However, since George William's daughter was legitimated if she married, George's uncle George William's inheritance would go elsewhere, and this was something that George's father could not abide by. Thus, it was decided that George himself would have to marry his legitimized cousin, the daughter of his uncle George William, in order that all of these estates and titles would indeed come into his family. The girl was named Sophia Dorothea, and the relationship between George and her would be anything but easy, as we will soon see. George's family's rise towards prominence had been a quite lucky affair, but things would not continue to be so easy, as there were family struggles around the corner for young George and his father. As prestige continued to grow towards George's family, his father set his sights on two important things that would greatly affect George's future. First, he, understanding that once his elder brother George William, George's uncle, died, all of his inheritance would be transferred to him, George's father hoped that eventually he would be able to attain an electoral position or cap within the Holy Roman Empire. This essentially meant that he would become one of the electors who was able to elect the Holy Roman Emperor, one of the highest honors throughout the empire. There were eight electors at the time, and if Hanover was to become an additional elector, they would become the ninth elector in this group. This would not be an easy task, as the Holy Roman Emperor Leopold I did not just bestow this honor to anyone for any reason, nor would it be easy to convince the other electors to acknowledge Hanover's electoral position if it was granted by the Emperor. Securing George's uncle, George William's inheritance, thus obviously was a very important issue with regard to the electoral question, and was paramount in George's father's mind if his house was to ever be recognized in that capacity. Secondly, George's father, after generations of splitting family inheritance between sons, decided that he wished to implement the concept of primogeniture, which would see all the inheritance go to the eldest child, which in this case would of course be George. As one could imagine, George's brothers stood to lose in this situation and were not keen to accept this. Thus, with this in mind, George's father knew that George needed to cut his teeth in the real world if he were to inherit the vast estates and titles that his father hoped to attain for him. Thus, this in part is why George began going on campaign with his father at the age of 15. George was a good listener, an able horseman and soldier, and keen to advance in his military training. Gaining experience in the so-called Franco-Dutch War between the Dutch Republic, led by the future King of England, William of Orange, and France, led by the Sun King, Louis XIV, George grew in his capacities and matured as a soldier over the years. By the time he reached the scenario we discussed previously, where two of George's three paternal uncles had died, he was given independent command of Hanoverian troops. By 1680, prior to recognizing that he would need to marry his cousin, it was decided that it was time for the 20-year-old George to seek a marriage. Interestingly, George had been a potential suitor for Anne, the future queen of Great Britain in 1680, and had actually traveled to England for a time. But this marriage between George and Anne did not materialize, and eventually the dynastic question related to George's legitimized cousin, Sophia Dorothea, 
came up as we've already discussed, and it was determined that George would marry her instead. George was married to Sophia in November 1682, and was said to have been pleased with his new bride, although due to her initial illegitimate status, George was less than enthusiastic about marrying someone so much lower in status to him. The marriage now left the door open for George's uncle, George Williams' estates, to combine with George's family's Hanoverian estates upon George Williams' death, which would bring George's family one step closer to realizing their ultimate goal of becoming an acknowledged member of the electorate. By 1683, George's wife, Sophia Dorothea, was pregnant and gave birth to a son who was named George Augustus which was followed by a daughter being born, also named Sophia Dorothea, in 1687. This was pretty much the end of any positive relationship between George and his wife. By 1686, Sophia had become disenchanted and bored with George, as he was often away on campaign, and he had developed a relationship with a mistress named Melusine von der Schulenberg. She struck up correspondence with a Swedish count, who was serving as a colonel in the Hanoverian army. His name was Philip Christoph von Konigsmark. George's wife believed that George cared little for her, which was probably not far from the truth, although in that time she could not engage in adultery as her husband did. This, especially when viewing from a 21st century point of view, can be viewed as hypocritical in that George was free to have mistresses, but his wife could not. But this was the case in many royal marriages at the time. This was due, in their eyes at least, to the fact that any infidelity by a wife, especially a wife who would be bearing children in a line of royal lineage or important inheritance, could bring into question the legitimacy of the children. Thus, although there may have been flirtation or affection accepted outside of marriage, sexual contact by a high-born woman could bring forth great trouble for her, and in Sophia Dorothea's case, that is exactly what happened. Her relationship with Konigsmark continued to escalate, as the pair began to correspond with each other and eventually declared their love for one another. By 1692, this had turned into full-blown adultery as the pair began to meet secretly. Eventually, the affair became known within George's family, and both Sophia Dorothea and Konigsmark were warned by many people in the Hanoverian family that the affair must end. Alas, despite the grave warnings, the two love-struck lovers could not help themselves or keep away from one another. Thus, it was decided that something needed to be done to protect the Hanoverian name from the potential scandal that could arise from such things. In 1694, Sophia Dorothea was in Hanover while George had traveled to Berlin to visit his sister. What happened during this time is still a mystery to a degree, and it cannot be fully known if George's travels to Berlin were part of a carefully laid out plan that would ultimately lead to Konigsmark's destruction. On July 1st, Konigsmark returned to Hanover, and both he and Sophia Dorothea were watched closely by George's family. That evening, Konigsmark was discovered traveling discreetly to Sophia Dorothea's apartments, where she had stayed while claiming that she was ill. Konigsmark was never seen again. His disappearance was of great interest to many, and it is believed that George's father, Ernest Augustus, most likely initiated the abduction or murder, or at least played a part in it. A man that had been in his service, was seen to have received a 7,500% increase in his pay for the year, most likely as a reward for Konigsmark's assassination. What ultimately happened to Konigsmark is still not known, but many believe that he was killed and his body was weighted down with heavy rocks and thrown into the river. As far as Sophia went, she was immediately confined while her belongings were searched, which yielded her love letters from Konigsmark. An agreement was reached where a divorce was sought out, and Sophia Dorothea's father, George's uncle, George William, supported his nephew and younger brother in attaining this. By December 1694, the marriage was officially dissolved. This did not mean that Sophia Dorothea was opposed to this. She did not care for her cousin slash husband George and was happy to be rid of him. Little did she know what her future would hold, as the rest of Sophia's life would be an unfortunate affair. She was denied the ability to remarry, denied access to her children, and imprisoned, eventually at Alden Manor House for the remainder of her life, 32 years, despite her protestations and attempts to gain freedom. Although her imprisonment was light when compared to the modern-day idea of imprisonment, as she had many freedoms being allowed a court and was more or less on house arrest, she was guarded intensely and remained under strict lock and key proverbially speaking for good, as she could still very well be used by enemies to stir up discontent. So ended the saga of George and his wife, at least for the time being. <laughs>
Sophia Dorothea will come up again one last time at the end of George's story. After the debacle surrounding George's wife eventually faded into the background, it would be George's mistress, Melusine, that would become George's wife in all but name and remain with him to the day of his death. In fact, he would have three daughters with her, although they could not be officially recognized by him due to the potential for scandal arising. Nevertheless, George had a great fondness and love for his daughters by his mistress and treated them as his daughters, although they remained recognized officially as Melusine's nieces. Around the time of George's son's birth, and well before the scandal surrounding George and his wife, George's father had announced his plans to implement the primogeniture in the Hanoverian inheritance in 1684, as stated previously. Again, this meaning that the eldest son, George, would inherit all of his father's titles, estates, etc. We remember that George's brothers were less than enthusiastic about this announcement, and many of them actively opposed his father's decision. However, three of George's brothers would die in battle between 1690 and 1703, and the two remaining brothers eventually were brought around to the primogeniture agreement and relented. George's father continued to seek approval to become the ninth elector and was able to gain leverage when the Nine Years' War broke out on the continent between the Grand Alliance and Louis XIV of France, although it should be noted that the Hanoverians had been, of course, involved in previous European conflicts prior to this as well. George's father pushed to be recognized as an elector if Hanoverian troops were to be utilized in the conflict. The Dutch stadtholder, William of Orange, had by that time become King of England after successfully deposing James II of England in the Glorious Revolution. William supported George's father's aspirations of becoming an elector, and this, mixed with some support from other electors, convinced the Emperor Leopold I to assent to the Hanoverian wishes. In March 1693, George's father was officially awarded the electoral cap, which in turn made George the electoral prince of Hanover. Although this was a great victory for the Hanoverians, this would not be the conclusion to this topic, as many of the other electors were opposed to this addition to the electorate and would continue to oppose it. George served in the Nine Years' War, although none of his experiences were particularly glorious. But by 1695, he was forced to return to Hanover due to his father's sickness. Within three years, in January 1698, George's father, the elector, Ernest Augustus, died. George was now the new elector of Hanover, and thus a new chapter in his life had commenced. By the time George became elector, his father had already handed over the day-to-day -day government to him. George's father had done well preparing his son for the responsibilities of being an elector, and George was ready to take on his new role with vigor. The electoral issue was not quite over, however, as many of the other electors were pushing back to Hanover's admission to the group, and two of George's remaining brothers again took issue with their now deceased father's primogeniture changes while simultaneously converting to Catholicism. This was concerning in itself, but not surprising, as the two brothers, Max and Christian, were looking to gain prestige within the Catholic imperial ranks, due in part to the primogeniture change itself. However, further concern was added to this issue due to the fact that interesting events were taking place in Britain, as an important death within the royal family there changed the course of future events. William of Orange, we remember, had become the king after a successful invasion of England in 1688. He and his wife Mary had become joint monarchs until Mary's death in 1694, at which point William ruled alone. Because this couple had no children, Mary's younger sister, Anne, George's previous potential bride, was now the heir. Her children would follow her in the English line of succession if she became queen, which was almost certain after her sister Mary's death. However, Queen Anne found it difficult to produce healthy children and had only been able to produce one living son named William. In 1700, this son died, throwing the succession of the English throne into question. Because England would not allow a Catholic to rule their kingdom, they set out to find a Protestant to take over after Queen Anne died, if and when this ever happened. Thus, William of Orange, at the time William III of England, and his government passed the Act of Settlement in England's Parliament in 1701, which put in the line of succession after his heir Anne, George's House of Hanover. George's mother was of course the heir before him because the claims to the English crown were derived through her and she still lived, but after her, 
George stood to inherit the English, Scottish, and Irish crown in addition to his Hanoverian interests. So how was it that George's mother was even considered in this line of succession? As we recall, George's mother Sophia was the granddaughter of King James I of England and VI of Scotland, the first Stuart King of England. Her mother had been Elizabeth, famously remembered as the Winter Queen due to her and her husband's failed attempt to take over the Bohemian crown. There of course were other descendants of James I of England that had claims as well, but due to Catholics not being able to inherit the English crown, almost all of them were disqualified, and thus Sophia and her sons were determined to be the proper heirs due to their Protestantism. Therefore, we can see why George's brother's religious activity that we briefly touched on, which included them converting to Catholicism, became more concerning as this could give to anyone who may oppose the Hanoverians coming to power in England the ammunition they needed to argue against George and his mother, as his family tree could be argued to be polluted by Catholicism to a degree. As we will see, there would be no shortage of individuals in England or Scotland who would be opposed to a Hanoverian becoming sovereign in Britain. But at the time of the Act of Settlement in England, the prospect of Hanoverians inheriting the crown was still off in the distance, and there were much more pressing issues at hand, mainly that of war on the continent, which was about to boil over into the so-called War of the Spanish Succession. The War of Spanish Succession, in short, was a war to determine who would inherit the Spanish Empire after the declining Charles II of Spain died. The two main claimants that would emerge were the French Philip of Anjou, a grandson of the French Sun King Louis XIV, and the Austrian Habsburg Archduke Charles, who was a younger son of Emperor Leopold I. As one could surmise, giving Hanover's activity previously, George and his house would be included in the Grand Alliance which would ultimately push for the claims of the Habsburg Archduke Charles. In March 1702, William of Orange died, bringing his sister-in-law to the English throne as Queen Anne, and George now one step closer to the English crown himself. Furthermore, his uncle George William died in 1705, and George William's inheritance now went to George. George's action in the War of Spanish Succession was initially limited as the powers that be, which included the English Duke of Marlborough, John Churchill, didn't take him too seriously. That is, until 1707, when George was proclaimed the savior of the fatherland when he defended the Upper Rhine from French attack. Although it is thought that George did very little to attain such praise, he nevertheless was able to attain something very important, for he accepted an imperial field marshal position which elevated his prestige, and this in turn, and in part, convinced the remaining electors who were opposed to the Hanoverians' elevation to accept it in 1707. George did not have much success as an imperial field marshal, and this was due in part to him being deliberately deceived by his allies, the Duke of Marlborough and the Dutch. The new Holy Roman Emperor Joseph I also did George a disservice when he appropriated funds meant for George to his armies. George resigned his imperial field marshal position in 1709 never to take up active service again. Nevertheless, his actions in this capacity served him well, as by 1709 and 710, he officially took his place in the Imperial Electoral College and was allotted one of the imperial offices, which meant that George was finally able to fully recognize the electoral aspirations that his father had initiated years prior. But a looming issue was still at hand for George, that being the English, or rather British, succession. In 1707, Queen Anne and her government had successfully united the kingdoms of Scotland and England politically, thus merging the two countries into one kingdom called Great Britain. This was necessary due to the fact that there were many in Scotland and England who opposed the Hanoverian becoming their king, especially the English political party known as the Tories. Because the act that William of Orange had assisted in passing in 1701 was only applicable in England, it was worried that Scotland's separate parliament might reject the Hanoverian succession, which could open the door to a restoration of the deposed Catholic King James II's son named James Francis Edward Stuart, also known as the Pretender. Indeed, the Hanoverian succession was not popular in Scotland, and many of the Scots did indeed hold Jacobite tendencies, Jacobites being supporters of James II and his son the Pretender. 
England had its fair share of Jacobites as well, and it was worried by George and his mother that if the Hanoverian succession was not secured by having the Hanoverian family allowed in Britain, a Jacobite restoration might become a reality. Despite this, Queen Anne refused to allow her heirs to enter her kingdom, as she feared that they would be utilized as the head of an opposition for those within Britain who opposed her policies. This was not necessarily wrong, and George would have been smart to take note of this when attempting to understand British politics, which was still somewhat foreign to him at this point, as he would have to deal with the very issue that Queen Anne was trying to avoid himself. Furthermore, Queen Anne was switching from supporting the so-called Whig Party, which had supported the British war effort, to the Tories touched on previously, who had been generally opposed to the war. The successful Duke of Marlborough was removed from his positions as Anne moved towards making a separate peace with the French in the War of Spanish Succession. George, being a vassal of the Holy Roman Emperor, was of course opposed to Britain making a separate peace, and he made it known publicly that he was not happy with Anne's change of direction. This would not matter, as Anne and her government eventually made a separate peace with France via the Peace of Utrecht, to George and many other allies' dismay. George and the Empire continued the war with the French for some time, but they too eventually made peace with France between 1714 and 1715. 1714 was an important year for George, however, for different reasons. Anne continued to resist he, his son, and his mother coming to England while she still lived, but her health was rapidly failing. Unfortunately, in June 1714, George's mother, an heir to the British crown before him, died after walking in the gardens of Herrenhausen. This elevated George in the line of British succession to the position of direct heir. Although the pretender, James Francis Edward Stuart, had been sought out by some in England and had been questioned on whether he would be willing to convert to Anglicanism in order to have a chance at contesting George's claims, he refused to do so, and thus eliminated a potential group of supporters that could have existed in England for him. Nevertheless, George arranged to have the Duke of Marlborough, now in self-imposed exile with his wife, put into a position to defend the Hanoverian succession if the pretender did invade Britain after Anne's death. This would not ultimately be necessary, at least immediately, but the pretender would remain a thorn in George's side for years to come. On August 1st, 1714, Queen Anne died and George was proclaimed as King George I by 1 p.m. the same day. It was time for a new foreign chapter to commence in George's life. Although many expected a Jacobite uproar once Queen Anne died, this did not end up coming about, as George's transition to the British kingship was a quite peaceful affair, despite him being 54 years old and foreign. George was not in a hurry to arrive in England, and did not until September 18th, landing in Greenwich. He brought with him his mistress Melusine and his three daughters by her, who were installed at St. James Palace. George's son, George Augustus, was also installed at St. James, and of course would become the Prince of Wales. George Augustus had already married by that point, and had fathered four children, including a son named Frederick, who was left in Hanover to continue his schooling. George Augustus was brought into the processes of government as George was keen on assisting his son with experience as his father had done for him. Thus, George Augustus took a seat in George's cabinet and was installed on the Privy Council. Because George's religion was paramount and seeing that his claim to the throne ultimately was carried by his Protestantism, George was quick to partake in Anglican service as soon as he arrived despite the fact that he had been a Lutheran his whole life. Despite George's relatively smooth transition to Britain, this calmness would, of course, not last for long. Moving forward, we will discuss three separate and major issues that arose during George's reign in Britain. The first is the issue of Parliament and the factions within the British government, specifically related to some of his ministers. The second issue will be George's relationship with his heir apparent, George Augustus, and the conflicts that arose between father and son. And the third issue that will be discussed is the international conflicts that George would be forced to be involved with, essentially on two fronts, which included the Great Northern War in Northern Europe and the War of the Quadruple Alliance in the South near Italy. Of course, the Jacobite pretender, James Edward Stuart's pushes for revolution, will be sprinkled in throughout as well. Once George arrived in Britain, 
he was faced with dealing with the two British governmental parties, the Whigs and the Tories. Both parties were not particularly appealing to him initially, especially the Tories who had been instrumental in destroying the Grand Alliance with their successful attempts to reach a separate peace between Britain and France in the War of Spanish Succession. But early on, George was hopeful that he could steer a moderate course between the two governmental parties. The negative experiences he would have with his English government would be exacerbated by his flimsy grasp on the English language, which he had failed to lock down despite knowing that he would become king in Britain for some time. Although George dismissed some of the Tories who were heavily involved in the peace negotiations of Utrecht, he did install some pro hanoverian Tories into important positions in order to attempt to continue the moderate stance he hoped to achieve between the two parties. But the Tories were not willing to play nice with George, and clearly moved into opposition which caused him great anger. It was not long before a purge of Tories came about, and George turned fully to the Whig party as the party of his choosing. Some of the Tories left Britain to start in exile, with some going as far as joining the Pretender's Court, which only furthered the idea in George's mind that the Tories were Jacobites at heart. By 1715, George's first test from the Pretender came about via the Jacobite Rising of 1715, which ended up being an utter disaster for the Jacobites. The plan was to have exiled Englishmen land in the southwest, which would be simultaneously aided by a rebellion in Scotland and northern England. However, once the exiled Englishmen landed in Plymouth in the southwest, they found that they had no support, and the timing of the rebellions in the north was botched and was further troubled by poor leadership. The Jacobite rebels were defeated at Preston in November 1715, and this, mixed with the Scottish rebels slowly eroding away, left the pretender in an awkward position when he landed in December of that year. By February, he fled back to France, never to return to Britain. Two things are important to note here. First, Louis XIV had died in September 1715, and he would be the last French king to provide significant support to the pretender. Louis XIV was succeeded by his great-grandson, the five-year-old Louis XV, whose regent was a man named Philip, Duke of Orléans. Second, there were certain ministers that acted decisively during the Jacobite Rising Crisis of 1715, and one of them was a man named Robert Walpole. Walpole was the son of a member of the local gentry and a Whig politician who would, throughout George's reign, become an important individual, as we will see, and he will come up again throughout the rest of George's story. In 1716, an important and unfortunate shift would take place in George's political life due to his son and heir, George Augustus. George and his son had not always seen eye to eye on issues, and in 1716, this culminated into an open breach between father and son. George offended his heir in part by removing one of his senior aides and by refusing to allow his son to act as viceroy in Britain when he was away in Hanover. George traveled back to his homeland six times during his reign as a British monarch. They also had a disagreement related to George Augustus' new son's baptism as well. George found out the hard way, firsthand, why Queen Anne had fought so strenuously to keep him and his mother or son out of Britain while she lived. The British had a knack for rallying around an heir within the kingdom in order to give credence to their grievances. Prince George Augustus did nothing to allay these developments and eventually became in open opposition to his father by 1717, in part related to George's international policy. Of course, the Tories and the dissident Whigs rallied to George Augustus's court. George reacted, and in an incredible way. Ever since he had reached Britain, he was said to have been reserved and reclusive, acting as an absolutist elector would have. But after the breach with his son came into the open, his tone changed socially. He now began to fall in line with the practices that one would expect from a constitutional monarch. He openly courted his noblemen and women, provided dinners and entertainment, and worked hard to gain support publicly against his heir. He also punished his son as George Augustus was banished from court and George forbid him from seeing his children. Although George Augustus' wife chose to follow her husband, she was still granted access to the children. George and his son would eventually make up, and this was facilitated in part by important ministers, including Robert Walpole. In reality, the reconciliation was less than enthusiastic on both sides, as both retained a degree of animosity towards each other, and after the reconciliation, George reverted back to his less-than-social attitude with regard to public appearances and treatment of his peers. But this family dynamic is interesting to note. 
as a son and heir being openly opposed to his father the king would be a common theme throughout the Hanoverian span of time as monarchs of Britain. Interestingly, Walpole, who had great control over the House of Commons, used this breach between father and son to also get his point across, with other ministers of course, and brought George around to the realization that, to a degree, his powers in Britain were limited. He would have to play the game of politics cautiously, as there were many others in the kingdom who were capable of causing him great distress. Walpole would be out of favor for some time, as other ministers gained George's favor, but eventually he would work his way back into power to the point that he would gain national attention. Walpole has often been regarded throughout history as the first prime minister in Britain, not only due to his tenure, but also to his influence and capabilities in his ministerial role. It should be noted that there were certainly other major governmental ministers that played a large role in George's political life and fought for control against Walpole and his allies, but this struggle for power will not be fully discussed here. The Jacobites would attempt and fail again in another rebellion plot in 1719 to restore the pretender, but this failure all but eliminated the pretender's chances of being restored to what he perceived to be his British realms. After this, some of those Englishmen who went into exile after George's accession now decided to seek reconciliation, and some were granted it. This 1719 Jacobite rising is interesting because it was aided by the Spanish king at the time, Philip V of Spain, who we remember was the French claimant to the Spanish throne, Philip of Anjou. He was at the time technically at war with Britain via the so-called War of the Quadruple Alliance. But how did Philip end up becoming King of Spain, what was the Quadruple Alliance, and what was the War of the Quadruple Alliance? Well, as far as housekeeping goes for international conflicts at this point, it is important to note that the War of the Spanish Succession came to a conclusion with the Peace of Utrecht when Queen Anne still lived, as we already discussed. By that time, the Holy Roman Emperor Joseph I, son of the aforementioned Holy Roman Emperor Leopold I, had died, and thus Joseph's younger brother, Archduke Charles, became the Holy Roman Emperor as Charles VI. We remember that Archduke Charles was the Austrian claimant to the Spanish throne in the first place that the Grand Alliance, which included George's House of Hanover, had supported. In the end, the agreement that was reached between the Grand Alliance and Spain saw the French Philip of Anjou retain the Spanish throne as Philip V, while Charles VI, the now Holy Roman Emperor, retained the Spanish Netherlands, which was a buffer zone between France and the United Netherlands. Additionally, it should be noted here that a Northern European conflict broke out around this time, which was called the Great Northern War. The history of this war is extremely complex in nature, and will also not be discussed in full detail here. But it is important to note that George looked to add to his Hanoverian land interests during this conflict, specifically the Swedish-controlled duchies of Bremen and Verden. The war was fought mainly between Russia and Sweden over Baltic supremacy, although there were many players in and throughout the duration of the war. George would fight initially against Sweden in return for the two duchies being handed to him, but George's relationship with Tsar Peter, known as Peter the Great, was not particularly good, and there was little guarantee that George could take from this agreement with his allies. However, in time, after the death of Charles XII of Sweden, the new queen, Ulrika Eleanor, finally agreed to cede the territories to Hanover if George agreed to switch sides and support Sweden with the British Navy. This was done, but the British Navy's resources were stretched at the time and little was done. Nevertheless, the two duchies of Bremen and Verden remained in Hanoverian control. By the time Louis XIV had died and Philip Duke of Orléans had taken over as regent of the young Louis XV, George was being urged to come to some sort of agreement with the French regent, not least because Philip V of Spain was reeling about not having his Italian possessions granted to him when peace was concluded. Neither the Spanish king nor the Holy Roman Emperor was particularly happy with the settlement that was reached at Utrecht, and animosity still lingered, especially with regard to Italy, where Philip V saw Charles VI as having too much power. George hoped to arbitrate between Philip V of Spain and Charles VI, Holy Roman Emperor, and bring them together in some sort of understanding to prevent war in Europe. But this was not to be. With Charles VI hands full in Turkey, Philip V invaded Sardinia in October 1717, followed by a landing in Sicily in 1718. Thus, the Quadruple Alliance was formed between Great Britain, France, 
Austria, and initially the Dutch Republic, who was eventually replaced by Savoy. The short war of the Quadruple Alliance discussed previously, where Philip V supported the failed Jacobite invasion of 1719, came about after this alliance was concluded. But by 1720, Philip V accepted the terms of the Quadruple Alliance, and the war ended with the Treaty of The Hague. Philip V would ultimately renounce his claims to his Italian possessions, and Charles VI would formally renounce his claim to the Spanish throne. Furthermore, the treaties of Nystad and Stockholm ended the Great Northern War in 1721, which brought forth the increased prestige of the Russian Empire and the decline of the Swedish Empire. Although there was an uneasy peace in Europe, this would unfortunately not last, and there remained one last scandal for George to endure in his life. We remember that 1720 had seen a reconciliation between George and his son, as well as the return to favor of Robert Walpole. Having Walpole back into a friendly position aided George greatly, as Walpole was able to weather the storm of the so-called South Sea Bubble. The South Sea Company was a Tory invention from 1711 that was created to compete with the Whig Bank of England. In short, its intention was to exchange national debt with company stock, which thus created a stock market for people to buy into. After the Peace of Utrecht, the company was assigned the right to trade with Spanish America, and the stock began to rise tremendously. Of course, this was simply an economic bubble which was ready to burst at any moment, and it eventually did in 1720. George and some others made quite a significant amount of money from the debacle, while most lost almost everything. It was not a good look for him, but luckily Walpole was able to weather the storm for George and bring some stability back to the markets. This of course is a gross oversimplification, but it is important to note that George made out quite well financially, while many others lost much, and this has been a stain on his reputation to a degree. Despite this, there were still serious issues at hand internationally that needed to be addressed. After peace was reached in the north and south for George and Europe, there still remained some lingering issues that would create problems. Louis XV of France had been engaged to the Spanish Infanta in 1721, but in 1723, Louis' regent, the Duke of Orléans discussed previously, died and was replaced by the Duke of Bourbon. This regent went back on the marriage treaty with Spain and sent the Infanta back to Spain. Therefore, angered by this French insult, Spain decided that they would form their own alliance with Austria via the Treaty of Vienna in 1725. This was concerning, as it could bring forth a resurgence in Jacobite support on the continent. Furthermore, in 1722, the Austrian Habsburgs created the so-called Ostend Company to compete with the lucrative British and Dutch East India Trading Companies, and the Treaty of Vienna between Spain and Austria allowed, in part, this Ostend Company to trade with the Spanish Indies, something very concerning to the Dutch and the British merchants. George and the Brits responded by forming the Hanover Alliance between Britain, Prussia, Hanover, France, Dutch Republic, and Denmark. Unfortunately, Prussia, interestingly led by George's son-in-law, defected from this alliance over to the Spanish and Austrian side, and Russia, now ruled by Catherine I after Peter's death, also joined the Austro-Spanish alliance, which would have threatened George's newly won territories of Bremen and Verdun. Indeed, another short war broke out between Britain and Spain, known as the Anglo-Spanish War of 1727 to 1729, which saw Spain attempt to capture Gibraltar. Although the end of this war would not come until after George's death, not much was gained by it. The Austro-Spanish alliance was not as solid of an alliance as was portrayed, and Emperor Charles VI and Philip V of Spain quickly tired of each other, eventually culminating in the deterioration of the alliance as a whole. Furthermore, Charles VI was attempting to implement the so-called Pragmatic Sanction, which would see his daughter inherit his claims, and he was looking for allies to support this edict at the time. In return for a guarantee of the Pragmatic Sanction he was seeking, Charles VI agreed to suspend and eventually disband the Ostend Company while simultaneously formally recognizing George's Hanoverian political conquests of the Bremen and Verdun duchies. Unfortunately, this is where George's story comes to an end. By 1727, he was 67 years old, and he had decided to make what would be his sixth and final trip to his Hanoverian homeland. He traveled from Britain to the Dutch Republic, reaching the town of Delden in June. It is here where the lines of myth and legend blur with fact and knowledge. 
Here in Delden, where he was staying the night, he was said to have received a letter from his now deceased wife, Sophia Dorothea, which allegedly prophesied that he would die within a year of her death. George was allegedly said to have been greatly shocked by this, and this letter caused him great concern. Of course, the story has been greatly doubted by many, but nevertheless, the following day he set out on his way to Hanover. He had been feeling ill, and during the trip he asked that the carriage pull over so that he may relieve himself. When he returned to the carriage, his face was distorted and his hand was moving out of control. He had had a stroke and fainted soon after. He was placed in his carriage and moved on to Osnabrück and continued to go downhill. Blood was let, which did not help his situation any, and although he regained consciousness for enough time to greet those around him with a hat raise, he soon fell back into unconsciousness again. On June 22, 1727, just after midnight, King George I of Great Britain, Elector of Hanover, died. He was 67 years old. Word traveled to his son George Augustus, now King George II of Great Britain, and it was decided that George would be buried in his homeland. He was laid to rest at the Leinschloss near his mother, but both were eventually moved to the Bergarten at Herrenhausen after damage incurred during World War II. His family mausoleum can still be seen at the Bear Garden, across from the magnificent Herrenhausen Gardens in Hanover, Germany, to this day. The reign of George I as it pertains to Britain is an odd reign to reflect upon, but nevertheless important. George was extremely lucky, not only due to his father being the youngest son who inherited vast lands and titles due to premature deaths, but also due to the Hanoverians being included in the line of British succession at all. There have been many to point out the loads of claimants to the British throne who had an argued better claim to it than George, but he nevertheless found his way to the crown. The reality of the situation was, at least at the time, that with James II's deposition and exile, Parliament played a much larger role in the succession than perhaps would have been found elsewhere in the world, and George's Protestantism was the reason he was able to gain the, albeit divided, support of the British Parliament. He was undoubtedly seen by many, maybe even most, as a foreigner in Britain, and his lack of fluency in not only the language, but politics as well early on, only furthered this idea. But George was no fool, for he learned fast and adapted well. He has often been accused of putting British interests behind that of his Hanoverian ones, and maybe an argument could be made for this in part with regard to the Great Northern War. But George was serious about his British position, and his interactions in Southern Europe truly benefited Britain greatly. He can and most likely should be criticized for his involvement with the South Sea bubble that cost so many so much, and perhaps could be criticized for his treatment of his son, although the criticism could certainly go both ways there. His relationship with his ex-wife Sophia Dorothea has not boded well for his reputation either, but she too played a role in her downfall and was far from innocent. George's attitude towards his new kingdom was perhaps also not quite what the British expected or preferred and his reservation was surely off-putting to many within his realms. But George had spent much of his life away from Britain, in a different land, with different customs, and a different way of living, and his experiences in a foreign land shaped his personality and attitude towards his new kingdom. Given the fact that the Jacobite threat was kept at bay, that Britain in many an instance served as somewhat of an international arbiter of peace, and that George was able to assert his British claim by confidence and political maneuvering with regard to managing factions and ministers, it can be argued that George's overall time as king can surely be seen as a success, but certainly not devoid of criticism. Although George is not the most well-known of the Hanoverian kings, he was nevertheless one of the most important, for without him doing what was necessary to inherit and maintain his place on the British throne, the history of the British monarchy could look much different today. George's actions as a monarch sent the Kingdom of Britain down a new route of Hanoverian rule that would, whether good or bad, last for decades to come and bring forth some of the most memorable moments in British history.